In this lecture we're going to discuss the response of multi-degree of freedom systems specifically subject to initial conditions. So consider here the case of a multi-degree of freedom system characterized by the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix mass matrix M, stiffness matrix K. If we apply our equation of motion we get this equation here on the top and that equation is equal to zero because there are no external forces applied on the system. However, there are initial conditions. So at the start of our analysis we may have shown here in red an initial displacement of the structure and we also may have velocities at each one of the masses. So I'm showing the displacements in red and the velocities in green and so those are what we call initial conditions. So we want to determine how are these degrees of freedom going to evolve in time under these initial displacements and velocities. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use modal analysis to solve this problem. And so the first thing that we're going to recall from the previous lecture is the idea of mass normalized modes, right? And these are such that modes, mode shapes are scaled so that phi transpose m phi is the identity. So that means that when the modes are the same, phi transpose m phi equals to 1, and when the modes are different, phi i transpose m phi j equals to 0 for all i and j that are not the same, right? For all i and j, when i is obviously not equal to j. If we take all of these modes and just make them into a matrix, so we take each mode shape and put them side by side as columns, we get what we call a modal matrix, which is this uppercase psi right here, right? So this is a modal matrix, and this matrix uh, contains all the mode shapes in its columns. So now we perform a change of basis and we say that we are going to write the displacement vector x as coordinates of this modal matrix. So basically there are z's such that phi times z gives you x. And these phi's are the mode shapes and we can write this same equation here as this. Right? It means exactly the same thing. We are basically taking each column, multiplying it times a constant z or a scalar z and we get x after we have included all the modes. Right? So this sum goes from 1 to n. These guys here are what we call modal coordinates very important. What does it mean? It basically means that these are the coordinates of X express in the basis of the Mo shapes. And this is why we call them modal coordinates, right? These are these are the modes. And these are modal coordinates. If we take uh, this equation and take one derivative because the fees don't depend on time, we obtain this equation right here which is also valid for velocities and if we take um, another derivative we obtain this equation for accelerations. 
So this gives us x, x dot, and x double dot as functions of the modal coordinates. If we go back to our equation of motion and we apply that modal transformation, right? So basically we take x double dot and we write it as phi z double dot and we take x and we write it as phi times z and then we pre-multiply by phi transpose obviously on the right hand side it's still equal to zero by definition phi transpose m phi is equal to the identity and phi transpose k phi by definition is going to be equal to a diagonal matrix which contains the omega squares right so this is identity matrix and this is a matrix that we're gonna call lambda which contains by definition all the lambdas lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda n lambdas equals to omega square so this is omega 1 square omega 2 square etc until omega n square zero everywhere else this matrix is diagonal due to the property of the mode shapes which are orthogonal with respect to m and k and mass normalized mode shapes are not only orthogonal they are orthonormal with the mass matrix so we can then take the uh, initial conditions and express them in the modal coordinates and we get this equation down here right simply by multiplying by the inverse of the mo shape we get the initial modal coordinate and multiplying the initial velocity by the inverse of the modal matrix we obtain the initial velocity in modal coordinates we can then take each one of these equations as you may see from here since this is the identity on m phi transpose m phi and this other matrix phi transpose k phi is diagonal when you look at each one of the equations basically what has happened is that these equations have become decoupled and now instead of having an n by n coupled system of equations we have n uncoupled equations so we have n uncoupled equations which are all like single degrees of freedom and we've already covered in class what is the response of a single degree of freedom to an initial condition this is in 3.1 of your summary the solution to that if we write it in modal coordinates just looks like this where z naught is the ith coordinate of the initial condition in modal coordinates and z naught dot is the ith coordinate of the initial modal velocities both of these come from this equation right here right this is for the velocity this for the displacement for the displacement i'm sorry on the left and the velocity on the right so basically we can get the solution for every modal coordinate in time but that's really not what we are after we want the response in the normal spatial co coordinates x so to do that we simply bring the modal coordinates back by multiplying by phi right that was our original 
definition, right? This is what we said right here. So to obtain the physical coordinates in X, we simply multiply the modal coordinate by phi. And so that's what we're doing in this step. So after we have the time response of each modal coordinate, then we obtain the physical response by simply adding them up by the, with their corresponding mode shape. And this is what is being shown right here. So this is the response in time. The mode shape multiplied by its corresponding modal response and then you add that up for all the mode shapes.